fall of the Berlin Wall just over 30 years ago came amidst sweeping changes that would end the Cold War and see the downfall of authoritarian communist regimes across Eastern Europe. But three decades on, the pro-democracy optimism of those days has turned sour, replaced by rising xenophobia and populist nationalism in countries once held behind the Iron Curtain. So what went wrong? In the first of two special reports, we've been to Germany to find out. The Berlin Wall was the most potent symbol of the division between East and West during the Cold War. Its demise towards the end of 1989 brought hope to millions, not only in Germany, but throughout the world. Sie wollten in Freiheit leben. Sie wollten, uh, dass sich etwas ändert. But 30 years on, things haven't turned out quite as expected. Fascism and racism have come back with a vengeance. It seems that xenophobic attitudes were always there. People just didn't dare to express them. The rise of Germany's far right has been marked by hate crime and even politically motivated assassinations. This is a big challenge for democracy because Germany is a place where we thought that never could happen again. In the aftermath of World War II, Germany, like the continent of Europe, was divided by the victors between puppet dictatorships under the communist yoke and Western-leaning democracies. Berlin soon became the epicenter of the Cold War, also divided between the free world and communism. A city of intrigue and espionage in the heart of East Germany, then known as the German Democratic Republic, or GDR. Life in the so-called German Democratic Republic was life in a dictatorship. That means from the cradle to the grave, uh, life was organized and determined by the state. As the harsh reality of life under the communists sank in, more and more East Berliners headed west. To stop this exodus, the East German dictatorship began constructing the Berlin Wall. Families were divided, lives torn apart. East Berlin became a prison, but it didn't deter people from trying to escape, and many were killed. Hartmut Richter was one man who managed to escape East Germany and become a West German citizen. Incredibly, he returned to East Berlin and smuggled people out of the GDR in the boot of his car. I was nervous and Die mussten ja unbemerkt in meinen Kofferraum. Das ging nicht. Die Parkplätze waren überwacht, kontrolliert. He was risking his life. Das hat meinem Leben Sinn gegeben damals. Es hat mir große Freude bereitet, ja, den Leuten hier rauszuhelfen. Ne? Hartmut was eventually caught and sentenced to 15 years. But at least he survived to tell the tale. Many didn't. So why did so many people feel it was worth taking the risk? while West Germany motored ahead to become the industrial powerhouse of Europe. Under party leader Erich Honecker, the dictatorship of the GDR became world leaders in something altogether more sinister, mass surveillance. East Germany's state security, the Stasi, were the most insidious secret police in history. This is the Stasi archive. Files were kept on everyone. A colossal database to control the population. In 1989, 1990, when we started our work, um, there was a total of around 111 kilometers of files, plus photographs, thousands of audio and video files, and a smaller leftover amount of data projects. And what was the Stasi looking for? It was looking for your personal expression to lead your life in a way that would ultimately confront the way the party wanted you to live. East Germany was a military state. As well as a quarter of a million Russian troops, 
there were half a million East German soldiers. But it was the Stasi that people feared most. The Stasi had about 91,000 staffers, um, official uh, employees, and about double the amount, 180,000 informants. In other words, one in every 50 people were looking for dissenters, who, if caught, were incarcerated in a network of prisons. But for most people, the entire country was a kind of prison. As time progressed, the Stasi developed new techniques to deal with troublemakers. The strategy of demolition of personality, this is the strategy of Zersetzung, was sort of a silent way of killing people, of getting to the bottom of who they were, finding out every little detail about what the likes and dislikes a person was and their insecurities, and attack them where their inner personality could be hit, and, and through that trying to destroy the person. One such person was Vera Langsfeld, who organized pro-democracy protests in the 1980s. She was arrested and taken to Honschenhausen, the most infamous Stasi prison in the heart of East Berlin. This uh, Honschenhausen prison was a very special prison because it was isolation imprisonment. No prisoner ever saw another prisoner, never heard another prisoner, never met another prisoner. It was totally still and you've been alone in your cell. The cells had no real windows, but uh, glass stones and a, a very small gap for fresh air. So you sat like in, an, in a cage, yeah? And uh, the only contact you had was uh, to the interrogator. That's why they organized the whole prison as an isolation imprisonment, because they have been very good psychologists and they knew a person who is held under conditions, not able to meet other human beings, not to speak with other human beings, never hears human voices, then he will speak with the first human being he's able to speak with, even if it is the uh, interrogator. Other methods of persuasion and punishment were less subtle. This is the basement section of Hunchenhausen, known as the U-boat, where water torture was deployed. Unable to break Langsfeld, the authorities expelled her from her homeland. On one level, Langsfeld was lucky. She was able to keep her children, but under a policy introduced by Margot Honecker, education minister and wife of the East German dictator, Erich Honecker, the state routinely took children from politically undesirable parents. It was in the DDR 72,000 incognito adoptions. 72,000, that is wahnsinn. Andreas Lack was caught while trying to escape with his pregnant wife and was jailed. When his wife gave birth, the child was taken for a forced adoption. It took Lack 29 years to find his son. Other parents have also tracked down their children, but it's impossible to make up for lost time. We reden here von einem halben Menschenleben, was man mir geraubt hat. Das Leben kommt nicht wieder. Das heißt, eine Uhr tickt immer nach vorne. Und was weg ist, kommt nicht wieder. Wir können das nicht wieder zurückdrehen. Lack continues searching on behalf of others. His organization called Stolen Children has more than 1700 members. The Stolen Children are perhaps the most poignant chapter in the 45-year story of the GDR. Small wonder people greeted the fall of the Berlin Wall with euphoria. But things didn't pan out quite as expected. While the Honeckers escaped justice in South America on exorbitant state pensions, the vast majority of East Germans were in for a nasty culture shock. 
Mentalitäten in Ost und West entwickelt. Im Westen eher die Westbindung, die Orientierung an Amerika. Im Osten die ungeliebte äh, äh, Dominanz der Sowjetunion. Äh, das war trotzdem sozusagen eine Herausbildung unterschiedlicher Kulturen, die bis heute anhält. Things began to falter early on. Within months, the East German Mark was replaced by the West German Mark. Nearly 17 million East Germans had just six days to convert their hard cash or lose it. Unemployment soared and with it unrest. 75 percent of the people in the ehemaligen DDR have lost their job. Verloren, haben viele Ostdeutsche sich als deutsche zweiter Klasse gefühlt. Unsurprisingly, many East Germans headed west. Highly qualified engineers or people who had other qualifications, medical doctors, for example, uh, could simply by moving to the west without any further problems uh, triple their salary. Um, and that led to an exodus of about two million people. As a consequence, even today, East Germany is littered with ghost communities, deserted villages, and half-empty towns. The former mining community of Olwein near Leipzig is typical. Now, just 15 people live here. The village was sold last year for 140,000 euros. The new owner said he had plans to turn the village into an inventor's community. But the inhabitants are skeptical. Warum weiß ich ja nicht. Da kriegt ja keine Raut so schnell. Ja, Wasser wird die Zukunft. Ich sehe keine Zukunft hier. Ich nicht. There is a feeling that since reunification, these places have simply been left to die. In Alvine, there is little evidence of the trillion or so of euros that poured into the former GDR from its western counterpart which was focused mostly on larger cities. Each euro that you invest in an urban area has about twice the return of each euro that you invest in a rural area. So if you think about this from the perspective of the taxpayer that has to fund the bill, it is clearly a better investment to strengthen the cities rather than try to uh, uh, develop something where there's essentially nothing left. But even the urban centers have problems. Hoyerswerda, a hundred miles south of Berlin, is an archetypal East German town made up of Soviet-era high-rise blocks, many of which now lie half empty. It's hard to believe it was once a boom town, supplying a workforce for the nearby lignite mines. It had the highest birth rate in the GDR. But 40% of its 70,000 strong population have left since reunification. Congregations at the town's church all but dried up. After the Wende, the Braunkohle industry was not more effective. There was a cheap stream from gas and other things. Then the industry was broken. Only a few is left from the Braunkohle. Und die Menschen mussten wegen der Arbeit oft nach Westdeutschland wegziehen. Aber man hat zu wenig die kritischen Auswirkungen dieser Transformationszeit der 30 Jahre in den Blick genommen. Und die haben teilweise auch durch ein neoliberales Wirtschaftsmodell äh, erdbebenartige Verwüstungen in der ostdeutschen Gesellschaft verursacht. The still reverberating aftershocks of this earthquake have led to growing disillusionment with democracy and rising xenophobia in parts of eastern Germany. Although less than 20% of the population now live there, the region accounts for more than 50% of recorded hate crimes. Wir kannten keine Arbeitslosigkeit. Wir kannten auch nicht diese diese Angst, diese Unsicherheit. Das war neu. Und deshalb war das dann auch ein, ein Nährboden für die Spannung dann mit, mit Ausländern und Flüchtlingen. Since reunification, the East German states of Saxony and Thuringia have given birth to a plethora of neo-Nazi and xenophobic organizations, such as Patriotic Europeans Against the Islamification of the West, known as Pegida, which was founded in Dresden in 2014. 
the group initiated what it called evening strolls, weekly demonstrations in Dresden, which have sometimes turned violent. It seems that uh, xenophobic attitudes, anti-Semitic attitudes were always there. People just didn't dare to express them. Pegida have led to the situation in which people feel empowered to say things that they otherwise, or well, 10 years ago, would have never said in public uh, or in, in, on the web. The already burgeoning far right received a major boost in the summer of 2015, when the refugee crisis began to affect Europe. Uniquely among EU leaders, German Chancellor Angela Merkel took a humane stance, allowing roughly a million refugees into Germany. Aber auch als ein Land zeigen, in dem das Grundgesetz gilt, auf das wir alle stolz sind und das ja erkennbar auch einen guten Ruf in der Welt hat. Perhaps unsurprisingly, this policy helped propel the far-right party Alternative for Germany, or AFD, into the Bundestag two years ago, with a stunning 12.5% of the national vote. Last October, in the regional elections, they did even better. Bjorn Hocker, party leader for the state of Turingia, took 23%. Höcker is fond of using Nazi-era terminology, like the contentious German word Volk, rather than people, as Hitler did. He's been compared to Goebbels for saying things like Africans are fundamentally different from Europeans. And he's also said that the German Volk are threatened by migrants. Um, I think I have a different opinion than Mr. Höcker, Björn Höcker. Uh, I think certainly the migration crisis is a, yeah, a potential danger for our uh, country. If you are looking, for instance, uh, to Volk or Völkisch, I think it's necessary that you might mention these things just to trigger a discussion. Höcker is arguably the most controversial political figure in Germany in decades, and some have even made comparisons with Adolf Hitler. He is a fascist, he is a neo-Nazi. When I see him, it's like, wow, uh, how can people still vote for this party? If you, if you see this figure, and they are lying, they are threatening, they are, they are so evil, like it, is, it was in a Nazi time. Annette Carhan is just one of many who see parallels emerging between the rise of the far right now and what happened in the 1930s. East Germany has struggled to come to terms with its past. This is Berlin's memorial to the murdered Jews of Europe. In memory of the Jewish victims of the Holocaust, built 60 years after the Second World War. Two words are absent from the memorial's title, Holocaust and Shoah, so no reference is made to Germany or the Third Reich, an omission which some people find curious. Nonetheless, it's an impressive structure covering some 4.7 acres just south of the Brandenburg Gate. Björn Höcke called the Holocaust Memorial that we have in Berlin a memorial of shame, but not in terms of the shame of our history, but in terms of the shame that it exists. It shouldn't be there. He called for a revolution of our commemoration practices of 180 degrees, which in our terms is uh, nonsense, because also you can turn around the Holocaust at 180 degrees, it's still the Holocaust. Philip belongs to the art collective Political Beauty with its trademark camouflage face paint. Ich. The group, which lampoons racists, took issue with Hucker's comments. He even said Hitler is not just um, black and white. Uh, uh, it's, uh, it's, so he's not just evil, basically. Philip and his colleagues decided to reconstruct a miniature Holocaust memorial in Hucker's village to constantly remind the politician of what Hitler did. 
Hacker's house overlooks the memorial. We thought that our obligation is somehow not just to have uh, the memorials in the center, like in Berlin, but also that these memorials have to go where it's urgent. And indeed, the situation is urgent. In October 2019, the East German city of Halle was put under lockdown after a double murder outside a synagogue, the latest hate crime committed by neo-Nazis. Eventually caught, the far-right extremist awaits trial. We were not surprised at all. Because in Halle, there's a big center of neo-Nazi activities. And there are a lot of people, um, and very radicalized people. So um, it was not surprising, it was just shocking. Despite rising tensions and increasing anti-Semitism, there was no police protection at the synagogue. Many observers have drawn a link between these racist attacks and AFD's rhetoric. Accusations the party denies. This is a, a, a tactic by the other parties, just everything which is happening and where you can say right wing, yeah, then they are trying to put us to, 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 um, to bring it in connection with the AFD. In the town of Cottbus, the Halle killings are particularly worrying. The mayor is just one of several East German politicians who've received death threats from far-right extremists. Die ganze Frage entspannt sich dahingehend, weil, sich, weil innerhalb von wenigen Monaten sehr, sehr viele Flüchtlinge hier nach Cottbus gekommen sind, über das normale Maß im Land Brandenburg hinaus. With tensions rising in the town, following a number of incidents involving refugees, the mayor appealed for calm. Then he began to receive threatening emails. Also, es ging konkret darum, zum Beispiel, uh, Cottbus hat viele Bäume, für dich ist auch noch ein Baum frei, um dich aufzuhängen, dich und deine Familie. Though the sender of the death threat was caught, the police then released him, citing freedom of expression. In June 2019, Walter Lübke, a prominent politician in the state of Hesse, perceived as too pro-refugee, was shot in the head by a neo-Nazi. Lübke had also received death threats. According to Germany's foreign minister Heiko Maas, there are 12,000 dangerous neo-Nazis in the country. Against this backdrop, the AfD goes from strength to strength. The AfD is the second strongest party in the East and the third strongest party on national level of all parties in Germany. What more do we need to see that our strategy is wrong, the strategy is 100% appeasement policy, and that we need something completely different? Perhaps even more worrying is the fact that Germany is in many ways a microcosm for the region. As we will discover in the next episode, these problems are being repeated elsewhere in Eastern Europe and on a bigger scale. 30 years after the fall of the Berlin Wall, whole regions have become abandoned. Vulnerable minorities find themselves under attack from nationalist governments. This is the kind of extremist, racist sentiment that we didn't see in this country for many, many years. And perhaps most shocking of all, many of those guilty of hate crimes during communism have continued to prosper. They transformed from communists to social democrats and they said, no, now everything is okay, we have democracy. But in fact, it was just a fake democracy. The hope and optimism that greeted the fall of the Berlin Wall, a time when anything looked possible, now seems like a lost opportunity as the continent veers into an uncertain and dangerous future. <laughs> <laughs>